This is Ray Mosholder with the conclusion of The Accused by Craig Parshall, Chapter 74. Will Chambers' final question to Colonel Marlowe was a technical legal one. In preparing for the defense case, Len Redgrove had urged his younger colleague to zero in on paragraph four of the war crime of excessive incidental death to civilians under Article 82B of the ICC Criminal Court. That element of the crime required that the conduct took place in the context and was associated with an international armed conflict. It was a kind of technical element. Will felt the tribunal would give short shift by simply assuming that the incident at Chakbo would qualify as part of an international armed conflict. Nevertheless, after Redgrove's insistence upon it, Will figured he should address the question, as there might be some ambiguity about the meaning of the phrase international armed conflict. Kunamarno, lastly, would you tell this tribunal whether or not your mission at Chakmul was in your understanding part of an international armed conflict between the United States and the nation of Mexico? Prosecutor Le Forger objected, submitting to the tribunal that it was irrelevant whether or not America was at war with Mexico, as Article 8, Paragraph 4 did not require any proof of that. She submitted that the word international was to be taken to it in its ordinary and plain meaning. That is a conflict between one or more nations and the territory within another nation, not necessarily conflict between nations. After a short consultation, Judge Brucker of Germany broke his characteristic silence in the trial to pose a question to Will. Mr. Chambers, am I to assume that you are interpreting paragraph 4 of Article 8 to require the existence of an international armed conflict in the sense of one nation state fighting another nation state? Your Honor, that's exactly what our interpretation is. Well, then, isn't the United States government asking for the chance to have it both ways? Hasn't the United States declared war on terrorism? We certainly have. Then can you point out on the globe where the nation's state of terrorism resides? Judge Ponty smiled at that, and Judge Korloff nodded in agreement. Of course, there's no nation, state, specifically involved in our war on terrorism. But the concept of a war on terrorism is a legitimate and sovereign right of self-defense of the United States of America. And I would submit that the War Crimes Criminal Code was drafted substantially before September 11, 2001. The drafters had not ever count, countenanced the possibility that a nation state like America would declare a global war on terrorism out of its sovereign right to defend its own borders. Judge Brucker was not convinced. You have not answered my question. It appears that the United States wants the best of both arguments. 
wants to declare war on terrorism without limitation to borders and nations, yet is requiring this tribunal to interpret paragraph four with its reference to international armed conflict in a way that excludes the war on terrorism from any elements of the war crime statute. Is that what you're saying? What I am submitting, Your Honor, is it paragraph four's reference to international armed conflict must be interpreted according to the language of the war crimes code itself. And the Rome statute, statute which acts as the preamble. If I may direct the court's attention to the Rome statute it says that the jurisdiction of this court with regard to war crime extends only, and I quote, over the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole. In other words, only those war crimes that have a characteristically international aspect. And that means war crimes involving two or more nation states or internal civil war between competing factions within a single nation state. Now Judge Ponty was joining the fray. Mr. Chambers, point out to me Anywhere, proof of your statement that your interpretation is somehow part of the history of the development of the criminal code. I simply reject that. I know of no support whatsoever for that statement. Can you enlighten me? Will paused for a moment, excused himself, and walked over to the defense counsel table. He snatched up a black notebook marked History of International Criminal Tribunals in the ICC, and then returned to the podium. Flipping open to a page, he looked up at the French judge. If I may, Judge Bonney, I would direct your attention to volume 89 of the International Law Review. Within it, is an article written in 1995 about the 1994 adoption by the International Law Commission of a draft stature for an international criminal court. That draft served as a basis for what would later be the ICC under the Roman statute. I'm still waiting for some proof that supports your interpretation of the word international as excluding the situation that occurred in Chacmo, Mexico. Well, if I may, let me call your attention to a statement in that International Law Review article. It described the initial work of the International Law Commission and its draft statute as extending jurisdiction only, and I quote, over grave crimes of an international character under existing international law and treaties. So what is the international community? Well, isn't that self-evident? I certainly think it is self-evident. The other day, I looked up in several different dictionaries the definition of the word international. Every primary and secondary definition included the concept of two or more nations. When we talk about crimes that impact the international community, we can't simply mean impacting global citizens of the planet Earth, can we? For if that's the interpretation, then this court is urging the breakdown 
of sovereign boundaries between nation states. That's certainly not the intent, is it? Judge Brooker saw where we were heading, tried to redirect him. So um, how do you define international community? Well, crimes of an international character. Respectfully, Judge Brucker, that that term doesn't apply to the circumstances as they existed at the time that the United States made a limited assault on my house outside of the village of Chakmul in pursuit of terrorists who posed a threat to the national security of the United States. That was not an international armed conflict. Judge Karloff weighed in. Can you give us other examples of what would not be an international armed conflict? After reflecting for a moment, Will answered, well, as an example, if a customs agent or perhaps a state patrol officer in the United States were in hot pursuit of a bank robber who then crossed the American border into Mexico and just on the other side of the border, a gun battle broke out between the customs agent or state patrol officer and a bank robber just because it took place on Mexican soil doesn't mean it was part of an international armed conflict. Or perhaps this, an American naval vessel stops at Cancun and one of its sailors goes ashore on leave. He's kidnapped by a drug cartel and the American military attempts to secure his release by the use of force on Mexican soil. That's also is not an international armed conflict. Will was ready to list a half dozen more hypotheticals, but Judge Kornloff cut him off, raising his hands and waving them. Thank you, thank you, that's enough. I think we see what your argument is. We're going to permit the question to be asked and the answer to be given for whatever weight it may have. We'll put the question to Colonel Marlowe again as to whether or not he considered the assault at Chatmol to be part of an international armed conflict. Sir, as I understood this situation, I had no reason to believe that it was part of an international armed conflict of any kind. We weren't attacking the nation of Mexico. We were defending the security of the United States from a small group of known terrorists. Will then rested the defense case. Walking back to his counsel table, the attorney wasn't entirely sure what might have been accomplished by his dialogue with the judges on an obscure point of international law. Indeed, he could only hope that as far as obscurity was concerned, his argument hadn't clouded what he felt were the truly critical issues in the case, issues that were now hanging precariously in the balance. Chapter 75 Francine Le Forget snatched up her notebook and legal pad and strode rapidly to the podium. Everything in her demeanor and her bearing indicated that she meant business and she would get right to it. Colonel Malu, you placed great reliance on the fact that your satellite technologies supposedly traced the signal from the cell phone of Abu Adis to the location of the kidnappers near Cancun, and again later to the house where you launched the attack. Correct? Yes, ma'am. 
I've testified that we identified that signal on two separate occasions, tying Abu Adas to the group of kidnappers and then tying him to the house we attacked. Correct me if I'm wrong, Colonel, but is this cell phone a small portable item that can be handed from one person to another? Yes, ma'am. Thus, Abu Addis, even if he had been the one who owned the cell phone, could have handed it off to someone else. And your sophisticated satellite equipment would have been picking up the location of the cell phone. But it would not necessarily have been registering the location or even the presence of Abu Addis himself. Yes, ma'am, that would be true, except that's so it's true. You had no reason to believe you were locating Abu Adis. You were only locating a cell phone that might have been passed off to somebody else. Madam Prosecutor, if I might answer, what I was trying to say is that your question has a wrong assumption in it. Abu Anas was known to have several cell phones, but the cell phone number in question belonged to the phone he protected with his life, it was his most secure number, and he was known to have killed others who had come into possession of it. The chances that Anas passed off that cell phone with that number to someone else during the time of our mission, are infinitesimally small, almost non-existent, as far as I'm concerned. Late Forget decided to change direction. You've listed the high-ranking government officials who participated in the decision to undertake this mission. I know that you did not mention the presence of either the President or the Vice President of the United States in that meeting. Marlowe smiled. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Neither of them was present during that meeting. But because of the high-ranking nature of the American government officials present there, you were certainly given the information that the President himself had approved this mission. Is that correct? Marlowe eyed the prosecutor. He knew something about booby traps, but he also knew they were usually more carefully disguised than this one. Ma'am, I had absolutely no information to lead me to believe the president specifically knew of or specifically authorized this mission. To this day, I have no information that the President himself was involved in authorizing it. The decision to undertake the mission was mine, and mine alone, in consultation with the government representatives I mentioned previously in my testimony. Any fault that may be laid on anyone's shoulders as a result of this incident is to be laid on my shoulders and mine alone. I appreciate the nobility with which you assume responsibility. Therefore, you accept responsibility for having committed a war crime at Jack Moore. No, ma'am. I accept the responsibility for having accidentally caused the death of an extremely close friend, his beautiful bride, and their two little children. To this day, I struggle with that tragic loss. Is that correct? Do you really? Le Forget with a tinge of sarcasm. Of course I do. And do you today 
regret your actions and the decisions that you made and the orders that you gave that night at Chak Moo. Madam, I regret that I was led into a trap by devious and evil people, but I didn't have sufficient information to have understood that trap and to have prevented the tragic consequences. But you knew there would be civilians. There might be civilians in that house when you ordered the bullets to begin flying into it. Marlowe took a second to respond. Will was glued to his seat at the defense table, waiting, holding his breath for Marlowe's response. I knew there might be a civilian presence in the house. That's correct. And yet you ordered an assault that was likely to take the lives of everyone in the house, including those civilians. Ma'am, I'm not sure I agree with that. The prosecutor bulleted her next question. This time moving away from the podium with her hands clasped behind her back, her eyes fixed on the man in the witness chair. Did you consider yourself the number one man? That is, you were man number one in the radio transmissions to your team? That's correct. And it was you, man number one, who indicated you knew there might be civilian loss at the very instant you gave the order to shoot. Correct? You're correct in that. I did say those words. The listening device of the Mexican police did pick up my words correctly. Lefourge handed something to the clerk who then walked it over to Marlowe at the witness stand. And look at these pictures. Look at the photographs of the murdered bodies of Carlos Fuego and his wife, Linda, and his two children. Study those pictures, Colonel Malo, and then tell me you regret the loss of civilian life. These are the civilians you killed. These are the civilians you murdered. Were these lives worth the tactical advantage gained by chasing some men through the jungle whom the United States thought might possibly pose a risk to it? Marlowe's gaze was locked onto the pictures in front of him. His chin quivered and he raised his face toward Le Forge. He was silent for almost a minute. After re regaining his composure, he answered, Madam Prosecutor, I, I can imagine nothing in this world that would have been worth taking the life of Carlos Fuego and his family. Marlowe cleared his throat and took a swallow of water. His expression was controlled, as if etched in stone, but the court personnel could not see the tears that were welling up in his eyes. As Le Forger sat down, Will knew two things, despite of the theatrics of her cross-examination. He knew that the prosecutor was moving from her initial theory that the United States has used Marlowe and his squad to deliberately assassinate Fuego as a potential CIA defector. But he also knew that Le Forge had confidentially, I, I'm sorry, he also knew that Le Forge had confidently built a convincing fallback position that proving that a war crime had been committed by Marlowe required to demonstrate only a high degree of recklessness in the face of very little 
tactical military advantage. If the tribunal accepted the interpretation of Article 8 of the codes, Colonel Caleb Marlowe might be spending the rest of his life in prison for war crimes. The attorney walked slowly to the podium for redirect examination. His task was simple. His questions were going to be concise. Colonel Milo, <clears throat> this has been a very difficult day for you. My question is going to be very limited. You were asked about civilian loss. Collateral damage was also a phrase that was used by the prosecution. You used both of those phrases in the seconds and minutes prior to giving the command for the assault to begin. And you admit that? Barlow nodded slowly. Yes, sir. That's correct. What civilians were you referring to? Well, not civilians, not plural. So you were considering the possible presence of one civilian in the house at the time you ordered the attack. Yes, sir, that's exactly what I intended. There were four terrorists who had escaped. It was clear to me that Abu Adis was one of them and that he had his cell phone with him in the safe house in Chakmul. When I looked at my thermal imaging scope, I saw four individuals seated. There was a lookout front. That makes five people. Of course, the fifth person could have been another terrorist, but I also considered the possibility he was not, that it was for all intents and purposes a Mexican civilian. And did you have any reason to believe that it was one civilian in particular? Yes, I, I did know his name. But American intelligence knew there was a high-ranking Mexican official who had been collaborating with the AAJ. I believe was that the Mexican official had given information to the AAJ to aid them in their kidnapping of Secretary Kilmer. That same official was a civilian anticipated might have been in the house that night. I do have a question to ask you. And if I don't ask it, I'm certain the prosecutor's office will be sure to ask it. And here it is. Why would an influential member of the Mexican government place himself in a safe house together with known terrorists immediately after the aborted kidnapping of the American Secretary of Commerce. Wouldn't that have been a very risky thing for that official to do? Exactly. But there's a reason why I believe this Mexican official in particular might have been willing to assume the risk. And what reason was that? We had word about the planning of an attack against the United States, that this official had sensitive information that was being delivered to Abu Addis directly. It was such a critical piece of information that I believe this individual would have risked apprehension in order to deliver this information in person to Otis, rather than trying to transmit it through a third party. Or via telephone, which can be monitored, or via a cell phone, which can be monitored even more easily. So what is it that you felt there might be? Why is it that you, there might be one civilian present? 
One who was a co-conspirator with a terrorist subgroup that had intentions to make some sort of strike against the United States. Yes, sir, that's exactly what I thought when I gave the order for the assault to commence. Will knew there was nothing more I could do. He rested his cross-examination and yielded the, the podium to Le Forget. But your assumptions about who was in the house, that it might be a co-conspirator with the AAJ, these assumptions were absolutely incorrect, weren't they? Marlo knew the truth and he would speak it. Yes, ma'am. My assumptions were entirely incorrect. After Marlowe's testimony, there was only one other item of business for the defense case. Will asked the court to receive into evidence the entire transcript of the deposition of Damon Lynch taken in the jail in Mexico City. Late for Jay objected vehemently, spitting out her words like an automatic weapon, arguing that Lynch had not been listed originally on the list of witnesses presented by the defense, and that the circumstances of his testimony were inherently unreliable. Then she landed the lowest blow of all. Your Honors, to show the unreliability of this testimony, you need only know that Mr. Chambers was so desperate to use Mr. Lynch's lies that he struck a deal with him. Mr. Chambers agreed, as a transcript of the deposition will reveal, to let Lynch escape the consequences of his participation in the murder of Chambers' own first wife, Audra Chambers, in return for his testimony. The three judges sat bug-eyed. Then Judge Karloff responded. This is most outrageous, Mr. Chambers, the presiding judge said, drumming the fingers of both hands on the bench. This is most troubling. By what darkened logic did you arrive at a decision to bargain with this Mr. Lynch, even though he was apparently involved in the death of your own wife? Willis spent his entire adult life in courtrooms around America. He was rarely at a loss for words. But then at that moment, utterance escaped him. And after a protracted period of silence, he addressed the tribunal. I believe it was the French philosopher Pascal who said that the human heart has reasons which reasons can't know. To answer you, Your Honor, this was not a matter of logic was a matter of sacrifice, perhaps even of forgiveness, as strange as that may sound. My desire for revenge upon and punishment for Damon Lynch needed to be sacrificed in order to, in order to overcome evil with good. Good, Judge Ponty exclaimed. What good could you possibly be talking about? The good of the truth. That you three judges would know the truth about the identity of the Mexican official who conspired to set a trap for Colonel Marlowe and caused the death of four innocent individuals. The truth, I hope, will motivate your sense of justice and your decision to acquit Colonel Marlowe. 
I have no explanation other than that. After the three judges quietly confirmed, Judge Karloff addressed the lawyers. We will allow the transcript of the deposition of Damon Lynch to come into evidence, but with the understanding that we are inclined to view his comments with a high degree of suspicion, if not contempt. Will made the perfunctory motion for dismissal of the proceedings in favor of acquittal. And Korlov indicated that they would defer decision on that. He was about to make another comment when he saw something that stopped him. A clerk hurriedly approached the bench and passed a letter to him. Korloff took his time reading the note, then started urgently whispering to his colleagues. The whispering continued among them and the faces of all three became animated. Five minutes turned into 10 minutes, then 20 minutes. Whatever it was they were discussing, it seemed to center on the letter. Finally, the presiding judge clicked his microphone back on. He leaned forward. This proceeding is adjourned for five hours. All lawyers and personnel are to be present again in five hours. The courtroom rose as the judges quickly disappeared through the doors of the chambers. Leigh Forger packed up her briefcase with an air of smugness. Will took a few steps toward her and extended his right hand. May justice be done. The prosecutor took his hand limply, offered a half smile, then turned and exited the courtroom with her assistance. Chapter 76. After the session was adjourned, the bailiffs permitted Will to spend some time talking with Caleb Marlowe alone in the courtroom. His client wanted to know, of course, why the judges had so abruptly adjourned for a short period. The attorney could only surmise that an ex had arisen in another case that would require them to participate in an emergency hearing lasting several hours. Final closing arguments had yet to be heard. Judging by the lateness of the day, we'll assume that the court, when it reconvened, would schedule closing arguments for the following day, and then it would inform the participants of its schedule for deliberations and for announcing the release of its decision on the case. Marlowe wanted to know Will's assessment of his testimony. The attorney assured him that no witness had ever performed more truthfully nor more effectively. As the two then chatted about a few personal things, the colonel said that the only positive point about his confinement was the quality of the food, which he found surprisingly good. Will then asked a question offhandedly. So if we're blessed with an acquittal in this case, what are you going to do with your life? His client smiled and thought about it for a minute. Well, I expect to be traveling quite a bit. Maybe I'll revisit Chicken Itza. We looked at him thunderstruck. Then a wry smile broke out on Marlowe's face. <laughs> for a minute there, I, I, I thought you were serious. Oh, I am. I think that's a 
fascinating place to visit as a tourist, El Cenote Sagrado. The great sacrificial well where the Mayans threw in human beings to satisfy their gods. You saw that place, didn't you? When you went down to investigate? Yeah, so I didn't have too much time to linger. I walked past it with Pancho on the way to the house. It's interesting how even the pagans who lived hundreds of years ago in the jungles of Mexico understood the necessity of a blood sacrifice to appease a deity whose sense of justice had been offended. Yes, I thought about that. Where they went wrong was in the presumption that humans could ever make a sacrifice good enough to cover their own sins. And as we both know, only the sacrificial lamb was capable of doing that. Will decided he would walk back to the hotel. His client would have to go back to his jail cell for a few hours. Before the two separated, Milo handed a blank white envelope sealed to the other man. When we win this case, and I believe we will, you can open this and read it, but not until then. Another mystery from his enigmatic client. Will took it and headed down the street to his hotel room. The air was clear and warm and the tulips were in bloom, filling big baskets in front of several shops. The horse-drawn taxis were out in full force, clip-clopping down the Middle Eagle streets. In spite of all the charm of the old world atmosphere, he was suddenly aware of how homesick he was for the sweet smell of wild flowers at his Virginia home. Jackie Johnson and Lynn Redgrave, Redgrove were going to catch an early dinner and they invited Will, but he declined. He'd go back to his room and call Fiona so they could catch up with a little life on their life together. Then he would ask for a wake-up call in a few hours and collapse on the bed for a nap. The prolonged schedule of sleep deprivation was starting to really get to him. Exactly five hours after the court had adjourned, Will, Professor Redgrove, and Jackie were seated at council table. Caleb Marlowe was brought in, seated next to Will. Le Forget and her entourage arrived. The prosecutor looked slightly distracted and strangely agitated. A few more minutes went by. Then the door to the chambers opened and the three judges in their robes assumed the bench. Judge Korloff quickly rubbed his eyes, sighed, and then moved closer to the microphone. Reconvening now, the matter of Colonel Caleb Malo accused. Are all parties present with the legal counsel? Le Forget snapped to her feet and acknowledged she was ready to proceed. Will Chambers followed, acknowledging the presence of Caleb Marlow, and indicated he was ready to proceed as well. Then Carlo started speaking. It appeared that he had some notes in front of him, and he glanced at them as he spoke. There are some preliminary matters that need to be disposed of. First of all, co-counsel for the defense argued at the beginning of this case that this court did not have jurisdiction, that the United States had made a genuine effort to prosecute Caleb Marlowe, and for that reason this court 
was precluded from hearing this case. And the case against Kodumalo was therefore inadmissible. We hastened to disagree with that argument. And we deny the motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. Will wasn't surprised. The Winnie Turner gave a reassuring look to Redgrove. The law professor was clearly disappointed. Also, we feel it is an opportune time for us to dispose of defense counsel's arguments in favor of acquittal and dismissal at the end of the evidence. We will not be reciting in any detail the factual record or the evidence that has come in throughout this trial. The presiding judge paused again and rubbed the bushy eyebrow over his right eye. Then he continued. We mention only, however, one very small piece of evidence, the testimony of Colonel Caleb Marlowe relating to his opinion as a military officer and obviously not as a legal expert that his mission at Chacmore, Mexico was not part of an international armed conflict. We're not bound by the opinions of laypersons, particularly that of accused in war crimes case, as to whether or not he believes he is engaged in international armed conflict. As Korlov halted again for a moment, seemed to will he was belaboring the obvious. The court was not going to rely on Marlowe's self-proclaimed defense that he didn't consider the conflict to be an international character under paragraph 4 of Article 8, Section 2B of the War Crimes Criminal Code. So this tribunal does not rely upon the accused own proclamation that paragraph four of the elements of the crime was not satisfied. What is important is not what Colonel Milo said in his testimony regarding that. Glancing over at his client, Will could see that he was struggling to figure out where the judge was going in his remarks, but without success. What is important, rather, Judge Gorloff continued, this time slightly twisting some of the hairs of his bushy eyebrows between his fingers, is what testimony did not occur during the evidence portion of the trial. Suddenly, it was as if someone spoke faintly. Somewhere in the recesses of Will's thinking patterns, that hidden place where law school professors say they're forming a lawyer's mind in their students, something slightly distinct from the thought processes of the rest of the human race. Will could hear a voice, and that small voice was saying that somehow all hope hadn't been lost. Not yet. Chapter 77 After clearing his throat and glancing down at his notes, Judge Korloff continued, What we did not hear, nor did we expect to hear, was testimony relating to the international aspects of the armed conflict involved in this case. The basic facts surrounding the ad actions of the BATCOM unit and Colonel Marlowe on behalf of the United States of America within the sovereign territory of the nation state of Mexico are essentially uncontroverted. They're not contradicted, they seem to be 
assumed by all parties. Colonel Marlowe, indeed the Solicitor General's Office of the United States, in its amicus brief, argues that the BATCOM unit was there because of the U.S. war on terrorism. The office of the esteemed prosecutor seems to agree that was the putative reason, but argues that the occurrence itself at Chakmul clearly exceeded any tactical or military advantage that might have justified the killing of four innocent human beings. Thus, those are the undisputed positions of all the parties here. That's the framework of this case. That is also, we regret to add, the dilemma facing this tribunal. As Korloff concluded his remarks, he folded his hands in front of him, and the two other judges, one on each side, stared directly ahead. The dilemma is simply this. The actions of the United States government and Colonel Caleb Marlowe in particular show a disregard for the human rights of Mexican citizens. Indeed, show a disrespect for the sovereignty of Mexico. And it was at this point will consider rising to object. The court had not even heard the closing arguments from counsel, and it appeared to be issuing its decision of guilt. However, something told the attorney he should hold his peace. He was glad he did. Nevertheless, the judge in town, glancing over at the bank of interpreters, behind the glass wall, along the side of the courtroom, then looking back directly at Will Chambers. It is the decision of this tribunal. But before he could continue, Judge Ponty reached over and grasped his arm. The two began arguing vigorously. It looked like Ponty was making a last ditch effort to redirect the tribunal's decision. Korloff was shaking his head. The French judge's hands were now frantically jabbing the air. The Russian judge argued back. Judge Rucker of Germany, expressionless, was leaning into the discussion, but listening only. Ponty, raised his voice one more time. But Korloff had reached his limit. He slammed the palms of both hands down on the bench. Then he raised his voice, gave his final response to his associate, one that could be heard throughout the room and needed no interpreting. Night, he said forcefully. Then he turned back to the courtroom and continued reading the decision. The defense motion for acquittal, that motion must be granted. Will, Redgrove, Jackie, and Marlowe all simultaneously jumped up from their seats. The professor thrust his hand into that of his colleagues and whispered, well done. Well done. Will was momentarily numb. Judge Korloff hammered his gavel to quiet the defense bench, and then continued, there is an ambiguity within an element of the war crimes offense that is the subject of this case. It is not entirely clear that the episode here issuing as it does from America's self-proclaimed war on terrorism, qualified as a form of international armed conflict within the language or the intent of Article 8, Section 2B4 of the War Crimes Code. 
Because this is a criminal case, we must err under the well-known doctrine of Leon Lenity on the side of disfavoring a conviction based on a criminal code of uncertain interpretation. This case is dismissed. The accused is hereby ordered discharged from custody. From somewhere, Will heard a gasp. He wasn't sure where. But before he could wrap his thoughts around the immensity of what he had just heard, Le Forget dashed to the podium, her arms outstretched. Your honors, I strenuously object. We do have a right of appeal under ICC procedure. Before I can make a decision on an appeal, I would respect request that the accused be detained in custody rather than released. Will was halfway to the podium to counter her argument when Judge Carlos signaled for him to sit down. The request is denied, Madam Prosecutor. You make the decision to appeal if you wish, but the accused is released. Francine Le Forget was stunned. She stood for a moment with her eyes wide open and unblinking. Then she cocked her jaw and tossed her head ever so slightly like a teenage socialite who suddenly and quite unexpectedly found herself without a date for the ball. She was too immersed in the agony of her own defeat to notice Adabar Strinsky, who was seated at the council table, struggling not to smile. Not that it would have made any difference if Strinsky had broken into a grin. He'd been out interviewing anyway and had already secured a new position with a large law firm in Belgium specializing in European Union trade law. In a few weeks, he'd give notice to his superior and the personnel administrator at the ICC. So all three judges rose to their feet and at quick step disappeared from the courtroom through the chamber's door, followed by two of the armed bailiffs. Another took a smiling, relieved Caleb Marlowe down to the detention area to gather his personal effects. Len Redgrove wrapped his arms around Will in a huge bear hug and whispered almost in tears, God bless you, Will. Magnificent. Jackie was clapping her hands and laughing, struggling to find an adequate response, but failing. You better get outside in the corridor. The press is going to be salivating for a comment on this. This is most incredible, Red Grove declared. Will turned to his old law professor. He smiled and put a hand out on his friend's shoulder. Lynn, he said with a smile, I'm going to go down and escort Milo out of jail myself. And I'd greatly appreciate it if you and Jackie could go face the media hounds. Give them some good sound bites. What little you can actually say. You know how to do it. You know the routine. He paused. And thank you both. From the bottom of my heart. Will took a side door, went down to the detention center, and announced to the jailers he was there to escort Marlo out of the building after his release. They acknowledged they would let him know when his client would be free to go. Will understood there would be paperwork and a processing procedure that might take some time. But after nearly an hour, Will grew 
tired of waiting. Would you check on the status of Colonel Marwell? He was discharged by the court more than an hour ago. How were we doing with his release? The jailer agreed to check and she disappeared behind a door. Another 20 minutes passed. Then the jailer returned, shaking her head. I'm sorry, she said with a thick accent. Kunumalo has already been discharged. He has left the detention center. Did he leave a message for me? I'm his defense counsel. He was supposed to meet with me. The jailer simply shook her head, puzzled. Will left the building, walked out onto the street. Briefcase in his hand, he walked along it toward the harbor on the North Sea. It was good to get some fresh air to clear his head. He wanted to call Fiona immediately and tell her the great news, but he was wondering what to do about his client and about the strange feeling of foreboding in the pit of his stomach. When he reached the water, he dropped his briefcase at his feet and leaned against one of the large gray posts with a tourist telescope. Then he sensed someone's presence and looked up. It was a familiar face, a familiar uniform standing next to him at the North Sea Harbor was Lieutenant General Cal Tucker. Tucker extended his big hand and shook Wills firmly. Congratulations. You heard the good news about Colonel Marlow? The general nodded. You came all the way here to follow the outcome? Well, in a way I did. I came in with some of the Navy, your little case here came close to an international incident. How much can you tell me? Just this, earlier this morning, President of the United States sent a letter to the President of the International Criminal Court, putting the ICC on notice that Marlowe's continued detention posed a risk to the national security of the United States. Will nodded. He now understood what that note had been that the Judge Korloff had received during the last day of the trial. I suppose you can't tell me what the President would have done if the ICC had found Marlow guilty. You're right. Then he gave Will another handshake and quickly walked back to his waiting aides, who escorted him to a small landing craft. And in a few minutes, Will saw the vessel motoring rapidly out of sight. Chapter 78 Will headed straight to his hotel room. He had many plans to rendezvous with Redgrove and Jackie and celebrate at one of the finer restaurants in the old section of The Hague. But first he wanted to call Fiona with the good news and then access his email on his laptop so he could catch up on things with his office. After reaching his hotel room as he tossed his coat on the bed, he caught sight of the envelope that Caleb Marlowe had given him. He sliced it open and read the note inside. It was typical Caleb Marlowe, direct but enigmatic and a little troubling. Will. I couldn't have had a better legal counsel. A job well done. Now I have to finish the final phase of this mission. This is the reckoning. I do need your help one last time. You have a card with a telephone number on it. Share it with no one but call the number. 
May the Lord be your shield. This wasn't the kind of message Will wanted from this plant. He'd successfully navigated Caleb Marlowe through a potential court-martial, a Senate subcommittee hearing, and the International Criminal Court, whether Marlowe's mission was real or imagined. He didn't know, and at this point he wasn't sure how much he really cared. Something had happened to him in front of the International Tribunal when his personal life and Audra's death had suddenly been interjected into the record. Perhaps the meeting with Damon Lynch, in a strange way, had forced him to confront and begin to move beyond the shadow of darkness that still lingered with him over his first wife's death. But if it had, then Will wanted to move forward. He wanted to get home to Fiona, to think long and hard about exposing his family to any more danger because of the high-risk cases he accepted. He pulled out his wallet and flipped to the little snapshot of Fiona he kept there, staring at his precious wife's face, which was framed by her dark, flowing hair. He remained deeply in thought for a few minutes. Finally, with a sigh, he retrieved the small white card with the telephone number on it. It wasn't something he wanted to do. Yet at the same time, he felt a title pull to make the call. Somehow, Will understood that there was unfinished business for him. Business, not just his own. Perhaps the completion of something much larger than he had ever imagined. He lifted the phone and punched in the number from the card. On the third ring, the agent in Mexico answered. This is Will Chambers calling. Prove it, Coral. What's up? I'm supposed to call. Oh, the man at the other end said. Look, I have to tell you I'm not in the mood to play 20 questions. My love said I'm supposed to call, so I'm calling. I'm the one who ought to be asking the questions. Well, maybe there was something he wanted you to know. Like what? My Lord believes he's on some kind of a mission. I'm really not sure what's involved. I would hate to think that a decorated war hero like Caleb Marlowe has gone off the deep end. I'm still not getting any answers. You know, Will, Mado may need you. I believe he's down here somewhere. Where, Mexico, right? Down here in Mexico. You may be able to do your client a whole lot of good and maybe even your country at the same time. I'd like you to head over to the commercial cargo section of the airport there in the Netherlands. We've got a plan, plan that can bring you down to Mexico City. We can talk down here. The attorney paused. He was tired of riddles, and he was homesick for his wife. The American agent at the other end, it was clear, was being deliberately obscure. During the silence, Will thought about something else. The reason for the intentional ambuig ambuigity, ambuigity, ambiguity was now becoming obvious. A collision course was being planned. Something was going to happen. Marlowe was certainly involved, and for some bizarre reason, so was he. Why did he think that this last unexpected chapter in the case of Colonel Caleb Marlowe, accused, might be not only a bigger thing than he thought, 
but more personal as well. What if the final road led to that unknown ground where the puzzles of forgiveness and vengeance would be resolved? What if he was being called to a place of ultimate sacrifice? He took a deep breath and cleared his throat. Then he asked one last question. On a scale of one to 10, what's the risk here? Well, Will, let me put it to you this way. Life is full of risk. There's a risk when you travel the freeway or when you fight for justice or when you put yourself in harm's way because you just may have the chance to save the lives of innocent people. Will was no longer wondering what he had to decide. His only question was, how would he tell Fiona? Do I need to get to the airport immediately? Yeah, I'd say so. What do I look for? There is a red and blue jet in the international cargo section. It's marked Liberty Cargo Company. There's a flight crew waiting for you. They land in Mexico City and we'll have some folks there to meet you. Will hung up and then took some time to pray. After that, he dialed Fiona. He wasn't quite sure what he was going to tell her. He didn't want to share the feelings of foreboding that he had. He wanted to tell her how much he loved her, how this first year of marriage had been the greatest time of his life. The two of them had talked about having children, and he wanted that. And he wanted to raise a family and grow old with her and to spend the next 40 years of his life waking up every morning seeing her face on the pillow next to him. But in his message, he had to settle for something much less. He got voicemail at home and on her cell phone also. So he left a very short message. Fiona, this is Will. I have one short side trip before I get home. I'll love you forever and whatever separates us now, the oceans, the mountains, anything else, will never change that at all. See you at home, darling. On his way out of the hotel with his luggage, he left a message with the front desk for Lent Redgrove and Jackie Johnson, letting them know he'd taken an early flight out and would meet them back in the U.S. Then he hailed a cab to the airport. He found the small blue and red jet on the tarmac, a pilot and co-pilot were leaning against the small stairway that had already been lowered. Mr. Chambers? Will nodded, scampered up the stairway and settled into one of the seats. In a few minutes, he found himself winging over the medieval spires of the Hague and heading back to Mexico City not yet knowing exactly why. But he was unable to shake the distinct and overpowering impression that there was something very final about this journey. Chapter 79. Making his way through the crowded lobby of the airport in Mexico City, Will wasn't surprised to see Pancho waiting for him. But this time he had a serious expression and didn't smile. The Mexican shook Will's hand, patted him on the back, and then led him quickly toward the exit. How was your flight over? Pancho asked as they reached the door where his cab was waiting. Bumpy. They had to take a wide swing because of the hurricane headed this way. 
Pancho opened the glass door. And as the two men stepped outside, the airport building, they were hit by a steep breeze that made their jackets flap. Will climbed into the back of the taxi cab, and not surprisingly, the American agent with a bull neck was in the back seat waiting for him, and the agent was blunt. I'm going to give it to you straight, Will. We need you on something. Kudumalu is waiting for you at a site near that house in Chuck Moore. He is carrying a briefcase. There's a meeting. Do you know who Manuel Abdul Vega is? Ha! Huh. You're kidding, of course. Of course I do. He's the guy who set up the Chuck Moore trap with the help of the AAJ. He's a sympathizer with the terrorists, and he works in the Ministry of Tourism for the Mexican government. Yeah, Olive, that's right. There are a couple more things you need to know, though. There are a lot more things you can't know. But since you received a security clearance as part of your defense at Milo back at Quantico, the top dog, top dogs thought it would be okay to bring you in on this on a limited basis. Will gave him a befuddled look. Here's the deal, Will. Vega has sent out signals that he is ready to turn and deliver to us some highly sensitive and invaluable intelligence information, all for a very large price, of course, so Marlow carries that price inside a briefcase to a meeting. Marlow gives the briefcase to Vega, and Vega delivers a piece of information. The attorney was staring at the agent, but it was clear that one large piece of the puzzle was still missing. What, what does it have to do with me? Why do you bring me down to Mexico City? I'm getting the impression that you've volunteered me for something I didn't ask for. I'm a lawyer, I'm not a soldier. What is it you want from me? You're not a lawyer today, Will. You certainly don't need to be a soldier, but we need you to be something else. Then the agent paused and gave his fellow passenger a sympathetic look. You do much fishing? Will didn't respond. But it didn't take him very long to figure out the homespun metaphor. I used to do game fishing. Out on the ocean, blue sky, blue ocean, yellowfin tuna, sailfish, marlin, yeah, I used to do some fishing when I was younger. Inside the car, it was quiet. The only sounds were the whining of the tires of Poncho's taxi cab as he motored down the federal highway and the whistling of the wind that was now blowing harder. So, Will broke the silence. I'm the bait. That's it, isn't it? Your friend, Demelich, has been told you're back in Mexico. We made sure he got a word that you're going to be there with Marlo. We are hoping that Lynch shows up and that he has the AAJ with him. In short, your raw meat and they are the flies. Oh, it sounds lovely, Will commented, staring out of the window and watching the trees and underbrush way wildly in the mounting wind. So, what do you think? The agent asked after a long period of quiet in the taxi. 
He could see the anguish on his companion's face. If it helps, we've got a vocabulary. I've got a cavalier. If it helps, we've got a Kevlar vest for you. And we've got folks who will be looking after your backside. None of that was of any comfort to Will. He opened his wallet and looked at the photo of Fiona once more. It was a picture he'd taken of her on their honeymoon. She was at the railing of their hotel. The azure blue of the ocean behind her. The sun was on her face, on which there was a look of bliss and beauty. He slipped the snapshot out of his wallet and put it in his top pocket, just over his heart. He had the sinking feeling he must surely do this mission, but that just as surely it might come with an enormous price to pay. Just tell me one thing. Is this just about capturing or killing some terrorists? Or is it about saving some lives? The agent leaned toward Will with a look of unrehearsed candor. You're going to be saving the lives of some Americans. That's what I was afraid of. After another moment, he added something. All right. Count me in. After more than an hour of driving, Poncho turned down a small dirt road that led to a private airstrip. The small jet was on the landing strip the stairs down the pilot waiting. As Will mounted the stairs, he noticed that Poncho and the agent were still standing on the tarmac. This is where we say goodbye, the man said, and he reached out and shook the attorney's hand. Not smiling, Poncho gave a last solemn wave to Will as he ducked into the small jet. Debris was starting to blow across the airstrip with the approaching storm front. Taking a seat, Will shouted up to the pilot, I've had some flying experience in bad weather before on a small plane. Just give me a guarantee you're going to get me down safely without any fancy stunts. The pilot laughed and told Will to buckle in. There's a strong crosswind, but we'll get you down before that air again gets too close to shore. As the plane winged down toward the Yucatan and the canopy of the jungle became thicker and greener, Will could see the treetops tossing with a high wind like a blue-green sea. The jet was buffeted considerably, but the pilots were handling it with poise. Will wasn't really worried about the flight or the hurricane or much of anything else except surviving. And getting back to Fiona and gathering her, her, her in his arms and finding a way somehow to make sure they could enjoy a long life together and die of old age. The jet dropped down so dramatically that Will almost became sick. Then it touched down roughly on a small airstrip in the middle of the jungle. As he taxied down the strip, branches and leaves and dust were blowing wildly across their field of vision. He heard the pilot comment to his co-pilot about wind shear as he brought the plane to a stop. The men quickly lowered the stairs and gripping the handrails tightly, Will slowly descended under the broken concrete below. Now the wind was blowing so hard 
that there was a high whining whistle everywhere. The pilot pointed to a car that was waiting about 200 feet away. There was someone sitting behind the wheel. Will, Will closed the front of his raincoat, hiding the bulletproof vest that had been given to him. As he walked to the car, fighting the mounting tempest, his eyes were searching for a glimpse of who was inside. And as he drew nearer, the driver's features became clear. The man behind the wheel rolled down the window. Hurry up, shouted Caleb Marlowe. We've got a very tight schedule. Chapter 80 Will Chambers ran the last few feet to the car, clutching his jacket together and jumped into the front seat next to Caleb Marlowe. Now, let me start off by saying that I'm really not glad to be here, he shouted over the noise of the wind. Milo smiled and nodded. Then he reached over and patted Will's shoulder. Don't worry, Private Chambers. You'll be okay. They drove through the storm that was now ripping through the jungle. They were on their way to Chichen Itza. Marlowe told him in a rendezvous point by the sacred well of sacrifice. Here and there, they noticed the Mayan locals boarding up their windows against the approaching hurricane. Occasionally, small flocks of pink flamingos and white herons flew past them, a startling contrast to the darkening sky as they winged their way inland toward safety. His companion explained as many of the details as he could of the planned meeting with Manuel Abdul Vega. Much of it made no sense to Will. And worse than that, it sounded as if he and Marlowe would be meeting with Vega in the open at the rim of the huge gaping well with no supporting military to defend them. Even to the lawyer's non-military understanding of logistics, sounded as if the two of them would be sitting ducks. Can I um, <clears throat> just point out uh, some flaws in this plan? You're giving a briefcase with money to Vega in return from, for some intelligence information. But I'm coming along to attract Damon Lynch and hopefully our members of AAJ. And even, maybe even Abu Addis himself. So what happens if they're watching and waiting for us? What happens when they come up to us and surround us and start shooting. You're going to have to trust me on this. Whatever information I give you, you might be tempted to share with someone else if this thing goes bad and you get captured. So what am I supposed to do? Just be visible. Just be there with me. None of that was reassuring. Will patted his top pocket to make sure the photo of Fiona was still there. The two men were silent. The wind noise had now reached a low moan, and occasionally a gust would buffet the car, pushing it sideways. The tops of the jungle trees on both sides of the road were flattening out almost to 45 degrees under the power of the massive air currents sweeping in from the ocean. There was this commander, Marlow said loudly, finally breaking the silence. This commander, Joshua, he had orders to advance, take all of Canaan. 
The first hostilities were at Jericho. It was a flat open place on the edge of the desert, an oasis with palm trees, vegetation, springs, surrounded by mountains. Joshua and his army had to take that place first. Will was silent, listening as the whining, roaring wall of the hurricane closed in on them. You know the rest, his companion said, his voice raised so he could be heard over the storm. The city fell and Joshua marched on to the Battle of Ai. Will had heard the Old Testament story, and he nodded. But before the fighting began, Joshua had this encounter. He sees this big warrior standing off in the distance. The warrior has a huge sword drawn in his hand. So Joshua says, hey, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Then Marlow paused and swallowed, stared ahead for a moment. Then he cleared his throat and went on, but in a voice more passionate than Will had ever heard before. But the warrior says, I am the captain of the host. He drew a long breath. I am the captain of the host of the Lord. And where you're standing is holy ground. He glanced over at Will and kept talking, almost shouting, with a moaning tempest rocking their car. The captain of the host is going to be there with us today, Will. I know you think that maybe this has all been about my getting revenge, the big payback, and I'd be lying if I said this wasn't personal, but it's much more than that. And no matter what happens, no matter what, because the captain of the Lord is there with us, we're going to be on holy ground. Then they spotted the top of the tall Mayan pyramid off in the distance over the waving jungle treetops. Milo bulleted out a quick spoken prayer, ending it by saying, as in the battle of Ai, Lord. As they pulled up to the grounds of Chicken Itza, a green Ministry of Tourism emergency vehicle blocked their path. Two uniformed officers who were standing behind a temporary barricade across the entrance to the Mayan archaeological site, ran to the car, holding their hats on. Marlow rolled down the window, greeted the men, and seemed to be explaining something to them in rapidly spoken Spanish. After a moment, they waved the two Americans through. Marlow pulled in and parked the car just out of sight of the entrance. He grabbed a briefcase out of the trunk of the car, the trunk lid almost blowing out of his hand, and signaled for Will to follow him. Past the towering stairs of El Castillo, past the Temple of the Warriors, down the path that led to the mammoth gaping hole in the jungle floor, El Canote. Sagrato, the sacred well of sacrifice. A man stood alone at the rim of the abyss. He was a Mexican with a neatly trimmed beard and short black hair, which was blowing wildly in the mounting storm. When the two Americans were about a hundred feet away, Milo turned to Will. You stay here. He strode through the wind over to Vega, who had his hands thrust into to his wildly flapping raincoat. The Mexican was nervously glancing 
from Marlowe to Will, then back to Marlowe again as the colonel approached. I want to see the contents of your briefcase first. Vega snapped loudly. Marlowe laid the briefcase on the ground unsnapped it, opened it slightly, and showed the contents to the other man, being careful not to let the wild winds catch the contents. You had some information for me? The Mexican said nothing at first. He chuckled and then spoke. You think you really know who I am? I know who you are, Marlowe said, now shouting above the roaring wind of the storm. You're a Muslim sympathizer with the AAJ. And before that, you were a bloodthirsty member of the military who killed and persecuted the Mayan population down here in Yucatan. I know who you are. I know what you are. But worse than any of that, you're the gutless snake that planned the death of my friend, Carlos Fuego, and his family. Vega laughed and shook his head. Do you have no sense of history? He bellowed with amusement. My ancestors can be traced all the way back to the Spanish conquistadors who came and slaughtered the Mayan chiefs. So you see, history does repeat itself. And with that, it began to laugh again. The information I want it now. Is this what you're looking for? Vega asked, taking his hand out of his raincoat pocket and lifting a small card in the air, which vibrated in the wind. His motion, as he raised the card over his head, was obvious enough for Will to see. It was also obvious enough to be seen by another set of eyes. Vega had just given the signal. An armed band quickly burst out from the edge of the jungle into the clearing, running toward Will, Marlowe, and Vega. There were three Middle Eastern looking men, each carrying an automatic weapon. In the lead, however, was a Caucasian man with a bald head. The three Middle Eastern men scurried over toward Milo and Vega, but the man with the shaved head strode directly toward Will. It was Damon Lynch. He lifted his weapon and pointed it directly at Will's face and then screamed out an order. Over there! Over there! Lynch screamed, motioning with his weapon with the other man to join Marlow and Vega at the edge of the well. As Will walked over, the wind was whining and whistling through the jungle blowing with such force that it was difficult for Will to go in a straight line over to Marlowe's position. Through the roar of the storm, he could hear Lynch screaming profanities at him as he walked. Will had a momentary thought that this was how it would end. A bullet in his back from the man who had watched his first wife die but he knew he couldn't dwell on that. He couldn't think about it. You were such a gutless wimp, the man behind him screamed. You could have had me. You could have turned me over to the feds. Now look at you. So here it is. This is my payday. I helped do your wife. Now I get to do you. Man, oh man, this is so sweet. Will's eyes searched the surroundings. He looked at the thick growth encircling the dark, abysmal hole in the jungle floor to see if there was a rescue in place. 
to see if there were American troops who were going to come and save them. Some glimmer of hope in what now appeared to be a suicide scenario. Will stop just a foot away from Vega, who is now between him and Marlon. The Mexican official was still holding the small white card in his right hand over his head. Abu Adas, with his scraggly beard and wild eyes, stepped away from the other two terrorists and yelled out something. Will couldn't understand, perhaps in his native tongue. Then Adas started to laugh and was joined by the other two terrorists and by Damon Lynch. You go first. I get to take you, Lynch shouted at Will. I wanted to do it slow and have some fun. But we're busy guys, ain't got things to do. Then he raised his weapon and pointed it at Will's forehead. Lynch's face had a twisted demonic look, not like pleasure or even pain but something beyond that. The near gale force winds were so wild that Will was having a hard time keeping himself standing as he looked down the barrel of the automatic weapon. This is holy ground. He muttered out loud a frantic prayer. Then there was a crack, a sound from somewhere Lynch, for only a millisecond, gave Will a dazed, blank look. Then he dropped to the ground like a bag of bricks. Blood was surging, surging from a sniper shot to the side of his head. Adis and the other terrorists whirled instantly, only to be struck by a hail of bullets and from the edge of the jungle, which cut them down before they could get off a single shot. Within seconds, Master Sergeant Rockwell and the members of the BATCOM unit charged onto the site with guns poised at Lynch and the three terrorists, whose bodies were sprawled on the ground. Then another group came running up behind the BATCOM squad small group of Mayan rebels being led by Juan Oxla Tulum, who had aided in the assault. Caleb Marlowe then turned to Vega, reached his hand out toward him. Give me the card. This is the end of the show, he shouted, steadying himself against the near hurricane winds. But Vega only sneered, and with his small card flapping, he stepped backwards toward the gaping edge that opened on the black, watery depths below. His left hand was still raised above his head with the card, his right hand still in the pocket of the raincoat that was whipping in the storm. As Rockwell and his men checked the bodies of Lynch and the terrorists to make sure they were dead. One Oxla Tulum ran head down against the wind directly toward Vega, lifted his revolver and pointed it at the man's heart. Put it away, Juan. Put it away now. This is not your operation. We're taking this man in. We're doing this our way. No, I'm sorry, Colonel Marlow, but this man belongs to me. He's tortured and killed my people. Now he's going to die. The American held a hand out to stop the man later. His voice was barely audible over the roar of the wind. This is not the way we're doing this, he pleaded loudly. You should talk, Tulum shouted above the tempest blowing through the jungle. You, 
the professional killer backed by the American government. You should lecture me on killing? I kill only when I must, and only when I can justify it before God. But in his plea to Tulum, my Lord turned away from Vega, and in so doing, it opened up an opportunity. Vega squeezed the trigger of the revolver that was hidden in his left pocket. There was a flash of fire out of his coat, and the colonel was thrown to the ground by the impact of the bullet fired at him from a point-blank range. Tulum's eyes had never deviated from Vega, and he quickly put two rounds into the other man's heart, throwing him backward off the edge, down into the black waters that lay at the bottom of the sacred well of sacrifice. In the raging roar of the hurricane, no one heard this splash as Vega's body hit the depths below. But the hand holding the card had released it, and as he fell, the wild wind had picked it up and slammed it against Will's chest. He grabbed frantically at the small piece of paper, as if he were wrestling some invisible force falling to the ground as the card began to fly off into the air. He snatched at the card with both hands and then caught it, closing his hands around it. Rockwell and Staff Sergeant Baker were already huddled over the commander's body, and Rockwell was yelling into his headset, calling for medevac. Marlowe's face was white, his eyes dull. Chief Petty Officer Dorfman raised up, raced up to Will, reached over to unclasp his hands and retrieved the small card. Will could see a picture of a tomb prominently displayed, perhaps a card from a Mexican cemetery. I'll take care of this, sir, Dorkman shouted at the top of his voice after he extracted the card from the man's grip. Marlowe. What happened to Marlowe? How is he? Is he badly hurt? Will was yelling at the top of his voice as the approaching hurricane reached his full cacophony. I'm sorry, sir. You're going to have to come with me. He quickly escorted Will to a helicopter waiting in the clearing. Then he yelled into his headset. We have the code, but the coral snake is dead, and Marlowe's down. As he climbed in, Will saw two medics racing from the helicopter back toward Marlowe's position, where he lay terribly wounded. As their aircraft lifted off, it was buffeted violently by high winds, but soon they were high over the undulating canopy of the jungle, and as they traveled due north, the winds, though still powerful, began subsiding. Will didn't know it, then, but he would not see Colonel Caleb Marlowe again before the funeral, which would be held ten days later. Chapter 81 There was much that Will Chambers would never learn, like the meaning of the small card with the tombstone that Vega had been holding and that Marlowe and the American operatives wanted so frantically to obtain. Its deeper meaning was lost on Will. He was just glad he had caught it in the hurricane force wind. He'd been an outfielder in his high school baseball days, 
but Erie could claim no athletic talent in the same. The catch had been nothing short of a divine intervention. However, by the time Will and Fiona, Tiny Heflin, Professor Red Grove, Jackie Johnson, and the rest of Will's law office staff would attend Colonel Marlowe's funeral in his small hometown in the panhandle of West Virginia, some facts would have surfaced in a major splash of headlines and television talk shows. The news would electrify and shock the American people. A plot against the United States Supreme Court had been foiled. On a day scheduled for Supreme Court oral arguments, a man in a small dingy apartment in D.C. rose very early. This man's left leg had been amputated and taking its place was a prosthesis, which the man strapped on. He had an important day ahead of him. His plan was to attend the oral arguments. He intended to obtain a visitor's pass using Ford Supreme Court bar credentials. He was to seat himself as close as he could manage to the front rows of seats just behind the council tables that faced the bench. Then he was to detonate the prosthesis, which contained deadly VX gas. If all went as planned, several of the sitting justices would be exposed at a minimum and would die within 24 hours. The man hadn't known until the day before Vegas death that Chicken Eats Son that his target, what his target would be. Manuel Abdul Vega had communicated it to Abu Addis, who in turn had informed the man which site had been selected for the poison gas attack. The tomb is what the message had said. It had been transmitted by passing on one of the cemetery cards like the one carried by Vega. That was the cryptic detonation for the white marble Supreme Court building. The little card that had been caught by Will had let the FBI know with certainty where the attack would take place. What Will would learn, along with the rest of the world, was that the man with one leg would be captured on the steps of the court's outer courtyard before even reaching the front doors. FBI agents would drag him immediately into the back of a sealed decontamination vehicle and lock him in. There he would detonate the device, killing only himself. And that is what Will, Fiona, and the world would discover. But as the little group of friends gathered at the small country graveside service for Colonel Marlowe, something else occupied their minds. They thought about his bravery and wished they could have said farewell to his body, but it was a closed casket. They found it disappointing that there was no military honor guard, except the BATCOM unit led by, Margin, by Master Sergeant Rockwell. The sergeant seemed strangely detached. Fiona had been teary-eyed but she started to sob gently when Rockwell walked over to Will and placed the folded flag from the coffin in his hands. After receiving that honor, Will put his arm tightly around Fiona, thinking about the battle account 
he had looked up before the funeral. The book of Joshua recorded the second battle of Ai as a successful ambush against the unsuspecting enemy who had drawn out from their ancient fortress and into the open. Only in that battle, Joshua, the commander, had survived. It would be several months before Will would again consider the fate of his client and his friend, Colonel Caleb Marlow. It was on a Saturday. Will and Fiona had been working around the house. That morning, Will had caught the news on the television, including the oil deal struck between Russia and the United States. That didn't stop Warren Mulburn from becoming the world's wealthiest man with his Mexico project, though it did take a few billion dollars of his profit margin. Will greeted the news with a different perspective. The intruder who had threatened Fiona had never been linked to Mulburn, but no one could convince Will that the billionaire hadn't been the sinister force behind it. Afternoon came, and he was still thinking about that, and about Fiona's safety, and about the mystery of both forgiveness and punishment for evildoers. When he took the winding walk down the hill that would bring him to their mailbox at the road, it was a bright, beautiful day. Mountaintops off in the hazy distance were drenched in sunlight. At the mailbox, Will reached in and pulled out a few magazines and bills. <laughs> Always the bills. Fiona was up on the porch looking out for her husband. She spotted him and waved and threw him a big, exaggerated kiss that he couldn't miss. Then Fiona saw Will looking without moving at something in the pile of mail. She was too far away to know that Will was looking at a postcard or to know why he read it, then reread it, and then read it again. But that was when Will felt a lump in his throat, and he looked up into the sky and laughed out loud and wiped his eyes with his knuckle. The front of the postcard was a simple picture of the American flag. It had been mailed from Istanbul, Turkey, five days after the funeral. The postcard bore no note except for a Bible verse. As he had read it, Will had, sw Will had swallowed hard, then smiled as he understood its coded message. It was 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12. So death works in us, but life in you. We would wonder long after that postcard when he would ever hear from Caleb Marlowe again. Well, that is it. <laughs> Frank Ferretti, uh, Craig Parshall, two more books from each of them, three from Ferretti, but the third one for Parshall, I'm hoping will surprise you and you'll love it. Now, the next book is called Missing Witness. Attorney Will Chambers continues his defense of the truth in book four of the Chambers of Justice series. 
look for this exciting release on reachmorenow.com the next time I come to this spot in reading.